Okay, thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to talk about this and call it behavioral models, and I'll go through as quickly as I can because I know you guys want to leave. Uh, that's right, there's a camera here. I've got to stay in one place. Okay, um, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow back to California, so I'm from California. Um, and the course, let's talk about it. Um, we're going to talk about modeling individual behavior. So individual behavior is modeling in a way that any time you model, you're going to simplify reality. And so how do you know if you're simplifying too much? So the course is about how do, how do you know that? You test it. So you're going to test a model. And so with experimental and field ed evidence in the course, we're going to highlight um, very simple behaviors, things that are intuitive, behavior that seems natural to you and is not unsurprising, but it's hard to explain it in the context of existing models because existing models simplify reality. And so a lot of these behaviors seem shocking if you have your mind in existing models for long enough. But if you go up to someone on the street, it's very you know, not surprising. And so, you know, there's simple types of things that you see, like if you're buying a car, in your context of buying a car, it's a lot easier to sell a car radio to someone while they're buying a car than after they already have it. And it's hard to explain this. I mean, you can try to make an explanation, but probably one of the best explanations is just when you're thinking about buying a car, and the car is very expensive, you're thinking about sacrifices in the orders of tens of thousands of dollars the kind of sacrifice you feel that you can actually process and code emotionally when you talk about a 400 euro loss or a $400 loss, whatever currency you're talking about, it do, you don't feel it as much than if you already have the car, it's the next day and you want to buy the car, buy the, buy the radio. So these things have very intuitive explanations and there might be patterns and maybe we can build it into models. Other kind of behaviors, um, if you look at charities, charities often give you gifts. In the U.S., I don't know how charities work here as much, but in the U.S., they often send you a gift, and it seems puzzling because they actually want money from you, and why are they spending money on you? But on the other hand, you know how you feel when you walk past the Duomo or walk past the Castello and someone tries to put a bracelet on your hand, and they get it on your hand, and suddenly you feel that something doesn't feel right. You know, here's somebody who's giving something to me. I kind of want to give something back, right? So they're kind of taking... A, advantage, so to speak, of our instinct to reciprocate when someone does something nice to us, someone sacrifices for us. So we'll think about those ideas, look at experimental evidence, and we'll try to answer some questions and just address some. A lot of the questions we won't answer, so a lot of the course will be exploratory. We're going to learn things, but there's also going to be parts of the course where we just explore, I expose you to different ideas, try to get you excited about this. So there's going to be a good percentage of the course that is very topical and anecdotal, but there's also a percentage of the course that you're going to actually, you know, learn some real skills. But here are some of the kind of general questions. So um, is it economically relevant um, that a lot of human behavior is anom anomalous relative to current models? So it may be the case that it's anomalous re relative to current models, but should we care? We'll think about that. We'll explore it. Um, my answer is yes. Um, but, you know, you, it's definitely open to debate. So are we missing variables in our existing models that, if included, can explain anomalous behavior? And if we do include it, is it ad hoc? Are we just adding a bunch of assumptions that make the models intractable or silly or only very locally applicable? Maybe there's a way of uh, developing alternative theoretical frameworks, whether it's a classic economic model or something else, that can organize existing behavior that we see but predict new behavior. So we don't want to just organize data that's already there. We want to anticipate new data, explain things you know, outside of our current empirical uh, experience. And so does what exist? So we'll ask these kind of questions. So what's the course like? The heart of the course is individual behavior. So we're going to explore models of individual behavior. And so this is going to be, sometimes it's going to be mathy, especially at the beginning, because I want to give you guys a foundation in, it's a more abstract way of thinking about choices and very spare, um, which is choice theory. So we're going to talk about preferences, weak axiom, revealed preference, you know, connections between choice and preferences. Um, decision under risk, decision under uncertainty, learning, and models there like that. Um, we're also going to look at the evidence. So we're going to look at behavior in the lab. Experiments. We're going to go carefully through experiments, even carefully through instructions, carefully through design, because I want you guys to learn how good experimental design is done. Um, we're going to look at behavior in the wild, not just anecdotes, but field experiments. And we're going to look not just at human behavior, but animal behavior. We're also going to look at evidence from imaging studies, both on animals and on humans. So this, this is the part where it's motivating and 
topical because, of course, I'm not going to train you guys to do fMRI scans or anything like that. So it's more of a, you know, motivating examples, but carefully explained. But our principal technique is the experiment. And of course, what is an experiment? You want to create some variation, but you want to do it in a controlled way. And so we'll get really into what it means to be an experiment. That's my specialty. I'm an experimentalist, so we'll, we'll learn about that. We're going to integrate evidence into uh, new models of behavior and look at how that works. Um, and we'll cover applications to economics and to finance along the way. And then the second part, which is not as emphasized, is looking at individual behavior in social settings. So it's not just game theory and strategic reasoning, although we will, will look at that. It's more social effects on behavior. So we could use game theory as a device, as an environment, to see how social environments affect individual decision making. So it's not necessarily a test of strategic behavior, but we will look at that as well. And we're going to look at theory and evidence. So what are some useful skills? Now, besides just being exposed to things that are interesting, cool stories, nice experiments, cute results, there's some things that I want you guys to learn in this course. Uh, one is the basics of experimental design and test theory. So you're not just going to participate in experiments, but you're also going to design experiments. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to take you to the lab. I'm going to show how to write an experiment in experimental software. I'm also going to show you how to analyze certain types of experimental data. And why is this relevant? Well, randomized trials, if you want to just think outside of uh, doing experiments on individual human behavior on college students in a lab, Randomized trials are used more and more in uh, field experiments and in policy studies. And so there's studies in development where they divide people into two groups and they randomly assign them to two groups using two different policies and try to see if there's a better effect on, you know, increases in certain important measures you, you might have. And also the exploration of incentive systems. Also in industry, you know, I have a friend who works for American Express and they design 20 different types of contracts to create different incentives for their customers to, of course, you know, maximize the, you know, their payment of interest, etc. So they use randomized trials of sending out different types of credit card proposals and seeing how it, how it works. Also, we're going to be programming simple experiments, as I've mentioned. Um, and so you can run experiments in a lab or over the, over the web and then analyzing experiments. So the type of analysis that I'll emphasize, because we're looking at individual choice, is dis discrete choice analysis. So if you might have heard of this, you know, some of the very simple ones are logit and probit and multinomial logit, and how to build your own models of decision making and back out parameters of individual behavior. And so how we learn this, um, I'll lecture at you, but I don't think that's the best way of learning. You'll participate in in-class experiments. You'll do, you'll do some homework in a group. This will be around 30-40% of the grade. I'm changing it a little bit from last year, so it's still in flux. Um, solving some problems, reading journal articles, writing up your, your analysis of them, and maybe presenting them in class as part of a group, and designing your own experiment as part of a group. And you'll study for one exam. And of course, this is an elective course, so it's not a gatekeeping course. So the exam, it's going to test you fairly on the material, but it's going to be fair and reasonable. I'm not trying to fail at everyone or anything like that. So last thing, and I'll finish. Here's some real opinion. I just got my feedback this year. Of course, it's biased. Uh, one of the most interesting classes I've ever taken. Someone actually said that. I'm not kidding you. Not everyone said it, but one person did. Maybe two. Someone said something like it. Um, Here's another one. The use of the IT lab for experiments helped to understand the practical implications of theoretical models and stimulated more interest in the topics. I, mean, I didn't tell them to say this. They said it. Um, I mean, there, of course, it was the first year I taught the course. So there, you know, there were some drawbacks, but I don't think I want to point that out on the slides. <laughs> the professor motivates active participation in class. So actually, I do. Some people were uncomfortable because I do come up to people and I ask them. I'm not trying to put people on the spot, but I want to see people's opinions. So I try to like initiate discussion and some people are into it and some days no one's into it and I'm just standing there trying to push people to talk but some days everyone talks so that's just my style. Um, here was the last, this was a negative point, the labs are not the best and Bocconi should invest a bit more in this. I got this three or four times. Um, it's fixed. Uh, we now have a new lab. They are just tore down the walls in the Grafton building we're putting in 27 computers. Um, we're going to be using that lab. We'll use the other labs for training and software and other things like that because they're bigger. So that's the course. Um, you're all invited to email me if you have any questions, and I hope to see you guys next year. Thank you.